Let Me Go Rock and Roll, Hard Times in New York City, 1972 to 1973. A band is like a puzzle. Some of the pieces get filled in right away, and some of them take a little longer. At first, Paul and I had a vague idea of what we wanted our band to be like. But as time went on, we began to hone in on what we were trying to achieve. We saw plenty of bands doing things we didn't like. And every time we saw them, we were able to refine our vision. Paul and I were primarily songwriters and singers. We could play instruments, but at demo level. We needed the rest of the band to fully realize our vision. After the Mott Street disaster, we got ourselves a loft at 10 East 23rd Street. It was the same kind of thing, half practice space, half crash pad. What we mainly did when we weren't sneaking girls up there was sit around and brainstorm about the kind of musicians we needed. First on the list was a drummer. One afternoon, I ran across an ad in Rolling Stone that said, Drummer, available, will do anything. I called the guy on the telephone, and even though he was in the middle of a party, he took my call. I introduced myself and said we were starting a band and that the band was looking for a drummer, and was he willing to do anything to make it? He said that he was, right away. He answered almost too quickly, so I slowed him down. Look, I said, this is a specific kind of band. We have very particular ideas about how we're going to make it. What happens if I ask you to wear a woman's dress while you play? He covered up the phone and repeated my question to a guy in the background who laughed. I went on, what happens if I ask you to wear red lipstick or women's makeup? By now the people in the background were beside themselves. But the drummer answered my question. No problem, he said. Are you fat? I said. Do you have facial hair? Because if he did, I explained, he would have to shave it. We didn't want to be like a San Francisco hippie band. We wanted to be big stars, not medium stars who looked like hippies. We were going to put together a band that the world had never seen before. We were going to grab the world by the scruff of its neck and... I guess I went on too long because at some point the drummer stopped me. Why don't you just come down and see me, he said. I'm playing at a club in Brooklyn, Saturday. Saturday came and Paul and I took the subway all the way down to the end of Brooklyn to this small Italian club whose clientele could easily have been actors on The Sopranos. There were maybe 20 people there, all of them milling around, drinking beer, and watching this trio on stage. The bass player and guitar player looked like soldiers in the Genovese family. The drummer was something else entirely. He had a shag haircut that looked like Rod Stewart's on a good day, and he had a big gray scarf. He outdressed everybody in that club, and he looked like a star. They were playing mostly soul covers, and when they did In the Midnight Hour, the drummer started to sing and this Wilson Pickett-styled voice came out of him. Paul and I said, that's it, that's our drummer. His name was Peter Criscola, and we shortened it to Peter Chris. We brought Peter into our loft on 23rd Street, and we began to play as a trio. It was 1972, and things were moving more quickly now. We had songs we were happy with, and our look was starting to crystallize. We were even starting to wear makeup, although it was far cruder than it eventually became. This new version of the band still needed to go before Epic to see if they were interested. The record label sent down the vice president of A&R. He came to the loft where we had set up a little theater, ten rows of four seats to simulate the feeling of playing in front of a live audience. He sat down and we played the three songs that we were most confident about. Deuce, written by me, Strutter, written by Paul and me, and Firehouse, written by Paul. The set went well, although we weren't sure that the A&R guy exactly understood what we were about. I was wearing a sailor's uniform, and I had my hair puffed out and painted silver. At the end of Firehouse, there's a stage move we had worked out where Paul grabbed a fire pail filled with confetti and tossed the contents over the audience. He went for the pail, and as he flung it towards the seats, I saw a look of terror on the A&R guy's face. Clearly, he thought the pail was filled with water. He leaped to his feet and headed for the door. To get there, he had to get past Peter Chris's brother, who was hanging out at the loft. He was a Navy guy who was spending the afternoon with us, and he had been drinking hard. 
As the A&R guy went past him, the brother made a kind of gurgling noise, then threw up on the A&R guy's shoes. Okay, the A&R guy said on his way out, I'll call you. Around this time, Paul and I recognized that if we were going to change the band, hire new players, write new music, we should probably have a new name. One day, Paul and Peter and I were driving around brainstorming for new names. I had thought of a few, like Albatross, but I wasn't happy with any of them. At one point, we were stopped at a red light. Paul said, How about Kiss? Peter and I nodded, and that was it. It made sense. Hindsight is twenty twenty, of course, and since then people have talked about all the benefits of the name, how it seemed to sum up certain things about glam rock at the time, how it was perfect for international marketing because it was a simple word that people understood all over the world. But we just liked the name, and that was that. I had been equally matter-of-fact about changing my own name. In those days, when I was rehearsing, working and traveling back and forth from Queens to Manhattan, I had plenty of time to ponder all sorts of things, like what the name of the band should be, what we should look like, and how the hell we could pull off the stunt of becoming the biggest band in the world. Most important, did the name Gene Klein have that certain ring to it? I decided it did not. On one of those subway trips, I dismissed the name Sidcup Kent for the new band and took on the name Gene Simmons for myself. It was as simple as that. Complete commitment. One day I was Gene Klein. The next day I was... Gene Simmons. I would never be Gene Klein again. We weren't finished hiring the band yet, though. We still needed a lead guitar player, and so we put an ad in the Village Voice. While Peter had fallen right into place as the drummer, the search for our guitarist was significantly more problematic. We went through audition after audition. One guy came in with a Spanish, the good, the bad, and the ugly cloth over him. His wife was with him, and before he played, she explained that he was a highly trained musician who had spent time with the masters. When he sat down and started playing, it was flamenco. We couldn't believe it, and, and we told him to stop. Oh, he said. He was faintly offended. This is in the grand tradition of the masters. In the grand tradition, I said, goodbye. Everything was like that, one after the other, loser after loser, even the winners were losers. One guy, a guitar player from another group, came in and really floored us. He was a fantastic player and a great guy. The only problem was that he was black, which wasn't a problem for us personally, but a huge problem for us as a band. He finished his audition, which was just phenomenal, then went downstairs, and we had an impromptu band meeting in which we decided that no matter how good he was, he just didn't fit our image. He was black, we were white, and we wanted to put together something that looked like the Beatles on steroids. I volunteered to go down there and tell him the truth, and I didn't mince words. I told him I liked him. I told him that we should hang out, and then I told him he couldn't be in the band because he was black. I couldn't believe the words that were coming out of my mouth. To his credit, he understood. In fact, he fired right back at me. If the Temptations uncovered a great white singer, he said, they wouldn't make him an offer, no matter how good he was. Meanwhile, we still didn't have a guitarist. One guy named Bob Kulik had played around town, and we really liked him. He was close to making it, and we were giving him the golden rule. Number one, you practice all the time. Number two, no phone calls. While we were talking to Bob, in walks this strange-looking guy with two different colored sneakers. One was orange, and one was red. We had chairs in the back lined up so you could come in and sit and wait your turn. Completely oblivious to the fact that we were still talking to Bob, this new guy plugged into the Marshall amplifier and started playing. Hey, I said, you out of your mind? Sit down and wait a second, will you? It was like he didn't even hear me. He just kept playing. We excused Bob Kulik and told him that we would call him later. We sat this new guy down. You better be good, I said, because two notes into it, if you suck, you're out on your ass. He just stared straight at me without any defiance or remorse. We played deuce for him twice, and the third time he got ready to play a solo, and it just fit. 
Here was this troublemaker who couldn't match his sneakers and didn't have the good manners to wait his turn, and he just fit. What's your name, I said. He said it was Paul Fraley. Well, I said, we can't have two Pauls in the band. Then he actually turned around and said, call me Ace. I said, call me King. I wasn't joking. Neither was he. That was the foursome. That was the Beatles on steroids that Paul and I had envisioned. From the start, it was a tricky mix. People say that certain couples are like oil and water. Well, we were like oil and water and water and water, the four of us. Between Ace and Peter, with their various insecurities, it was a nightmare from the very first day the band ever got together. It was all about getting up and doing what needed to be done. It never was about friends. It never was about hanging out. It never was, and to this day, it still isn't. Early on, it was very clear that Ace would enter the band warts and all. He had some very bad self-esteem problems and was a drinker. But in those early days, Peter was actually the most volatile. Mostly it was a cultural divide, one that I couldn't imagine crossing. When we first met Peter, we knew it was going to be a different world because Peter walked up and said, Hi, I'm Peter Criscola and I've got a nine-inch dick. Paul and I looked at each other quizzically. We were amused, but we didn't know what to make of it. Obviously, guys say stuff with bravado to each other all the time, but half the time it's to get a rise out of you or a joke. By the way he spoke, his tone, his attitude, they were all bizarre. The same kind of thing happened with Ace. We were at one of our first shows and the truck was loaded up and we were ready to leave. Ace wasn't doing anything. He always had guys who lifted things for him, and he was peeing. We're waiting for him, and the truck's lights are on him. He walks over and says, This is what my dick looks like when it's soft. He wanted to show us that he had the inches. Pretty early on, Paul and I were aware that we had just met two types of people that we had never been around before. They drank and were attracted to violence. There is a romantic figure in Italian neighborhoods, and that's the unlawful guy, whether it's the local bully or the mafia guy. That's the hero, the icon of all icons. Not Michelangelo, not Da Vinci. Peter was from that culture. Both Peter and I spent part of our lives in Williamsburg. I was shielded from the neighborhood by the yeshiva, but Peter would run through the streets and go up to kids and demand their pocket change. Peter loved that because of his self-admitted Italian posing. The idea of a Jewish kid running up to you and demanding your pocket change is laughable. It's just not what you learn when you grow up. I remember that as a ten-year-old, every once in a while, I would have to run down the street to get away from the gangs and get safely inside the yeshiva. Peter liked to joke that he could have been one of those guys chasing the Jews. There's another way to describe the difference between the two cultures, and it's an old joke. What's the difference between a Jewish mother and an Italian mother? The Italian mother tells her kids, If you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm going to kill yous. The Jewish mother says, If you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm going to kill myself. After one of our shows, Paul and I went to return the milk truck to the rental place. Peter had driven home. Ace was nowhere to be seen because he never helped us load or unload the trucks. After Paul and I finished the work, we had arranged to meet at two or three in the morning in Chinatown, where Peter was having a birthday party. His wife Lydia was there, his friends were there, and he was sitting at the head of the table presiding over the crowd. When Paul and I walked in, we looked like freaks. We still had makeup spread on our faces. At that point, we didn't have makeup remover. We just tried to wash it off with soap. So we came in late and tired. We just wanted some fried rice and stuff. Peter called for the waiter who came out of the kitchen and asked us what we wanted to eat. At that point, Peter started making fun of the waiter to his face with this mock Chinese speech. What kind of fucking way is that to talk, he said. It was very embarrassing to Paul and me. Please don't do that, we said. He's just trying to take the order. Peter blew up. Fuck you, he said. If you don't like the way I talk, why don't you just get the fuck out of here? He must have had something to drink, or at least I'd like to think so. Paul and I said, okay, if that's the way you feel, we will leave. Hey, Peter said, 
If you walk out that door now, I'm leaving the band. We looked at each other, shrugged our shoulders, and walked out the door. Peter was yelling all the way out. It was Lydia who talked sense into him, and he came back after two weeks. It was always about false bravado. The smallest dogs bark the loudest. We came to understand that Peter just wanted to be part of the excitement and that he took every setback very personally and very hard. His best friend was Jerry Nolan, who ended up drumming for the New York Dolls. The old Dolls drummer had died from a heroin overdose, and when they went out to hire a new one, Peter hoped that he would get the gig. He didn't, and he didn't take the disappointment well. As we were getting ready to play at the Diplomat Hotel, which was our first major coming-out concert to the industry, Peter was depressed and threatening to leave the band again. Paul and I had a war council, and we decided that we should do everything in our power to keep the band together, at least until we got a record deal. Then if things still weren't working out, we could always let Peter go and hire another drummer. It was all about pragmatism. We racked our brains trying to think of a way to improve Peter's mood, and I finally came up with an idea. Just before the show, we were all outside in full makeup, and Peter was belly aching again. I don't know, he said. I don't feel like playing. I'm not sure what I want to be doing with my life. Just then a Mercedes-Benz stretched limousine turned the corner and headed down the street. It stopped in front of us, and Paul and I turned to Peter and said, This is for you. Knowing that he was depressed, we had rented it for him. It worked like a charm. His face lit up. Now I feel like a star, he said. Let's go kick some ass. We piled everything into the limo, the guitars and the girls and the four of us. It was like one of those old college stunts where everyone crams into a phone booth. We were barely able to breathe, but we went in style. That's how it went all the time. The ship would start sinking, and Paul and I would plug the leak and keep paddling. We wanted the entire band to sing, and we wanted everybody to write. We wanted everyone to be a star. We wanted to do it like the Beatles, but with a twist, because we were taller and didn't have those little boy looks. An early photo from around that time shows us in semi-drag with heavy makeup. But as time went on and glam became a bit more familiar, we started to rethink our dedication to dressing in drag and wearing makeup. The first thing we did was go to all-black costumes. I had never seen a band all in black. When we started to design the mature version of KISS, we were doing things that no one had ever done in rock and roll. For example, the idea of having a big sign with the band's name on the stage, which was later to become a cliché with almost all heavy metal bands, started with KISS. You didn't have bands getting up there with big flashing lights telling you who they were. That was Las Vegas stuff, and that was precisely what we were doing. Other bands would come out, and the audience wouldn't know who they were. There were no signs. Sometimes they'd put their name on the drum set, but even that was fairly low-key. From the beginning, we envisioned everything bigger, grander, more over the top. We also started to put more thought into the makeup, and specifically into the idea of creating a character for each band member. Later on in our career, when we went to Japan, the reporters there wondered if our makeup was indebted to the Japanese kabuki style. Actually, mine was taken from the bat wings of Black Bolt, a character in the Marvel comic The Inhumans. The boots were vaguely Japanese, though, taken from Gorgo or Godzilla, and the rest of the getup was borrowed from Batman and the Phantom of the Opera. From all the comic books and science fiction and fantasy that I had read, and loved since I was a child. As Kiss became more comfortable in the second skin, we started to see how powerful our new look really was, and how it moved far beyond glam rock, which was already feeling as though it was running its course. The first official Kiss gig I ever got for us wasn't as Kiss, but as Wicked Lester. In the early days, I used to go to ridiculous lengths to get us booked into shows. Sometimes I would literally go door to door, knocking and waiting, until the manager came out, then trying to convince him to hire us. There was a nightclub called Coventry, originally Popcorn, in Astoria, Queens, and I managed to get Wicked Lester a spot there. It wasn't the weekend slot, though. It was the middle-of-the-week slot. 
Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, which was pretty much a dead zone. We gave our picture to the club, and by this time we had decided to be reborn as Kiss, thanks in part to Epic's decision to drop Wicked Lester. I remember very clearly when our picture went up on the outside of this club, Ace took a marker and wrote our new name right on the picture. The way he drew it was pretty crude, but it resembled our logo with the two S's like lightning bolts at the end of the word. It didn't make much difference for the show, which had a crowd of maybe three people, Peter's wife, Lydia, a girl named Jan, who I was seeing, and Jan's friend. But it was a booking, and soon there were other bookings, including a club called The Daisy in Amityville. Those shows were packed, but mostly because it was a drinking club with cheap beer and a biker crowd. It was the kind of place where you might see a pregnant woman with a drink in one hand and a cigarette in the other. It didn't matter to us what the places were like or how big the crowds were. We were on cloud nine. I had all sorts of odd jobs while the band was crystallizing. While I was in high school, I learned to type, and in college I even started a little business typing term papers for 50 cents a page. So when I came back to the city from college and was trying to get the band started, I took a job with Kelly Girls, later the Kelly Agency, which supplied temporary secretaries and typists to businesses all around the city. It was decent work and also a great way to meet girls, since there were very few guys there. Through Kelly, I ended up getting a job at Glamour magazine, and within a few weeks I became indispensable not only because I could type 90 words a minute, but because I knew how to fix the hectograph and mimeograph machines. Pretty soon, I got moved from Glamour to Vogue, where I worked as the assistant to the editor, Kate Lloyd. That lasted about six months, although at the same time I was working as a cashier at a deli. With all this work, I couldn't get to the practice space until nine or ten at night. But I made it, and we would rehearse until two in the morning. I never had a moment's rest. It got so busy that I moved my bed and my television set into the loft so I could wake up and go to work without traveling for an hour by subway. I always worked, so I often had to pay the rent or lend the band money for food or the subway. In fact, my social life started to center on the loft because I would arrange for the girls to meet me after rehearsal and spend the night. Not every girl dared venture into 10 East 23rd Street. Those who did were the few and the brave. Because this place was a hole. It didn't have any windows. We had put up floor-to-ceiling egg crates to dampen the sound. Some of these egg crates had broken eggs in them, so it was a field day for cockroaches. And you could hear them, the pitter-patter of little feet. One night after I turned off the lights, I had a girl on top of me on the bed, naked. All of a sudden, she let out a blood-curdling scream. Well, something must have crawled over her because she jumped up, ran into a wall, and fell down in the pitch-black room. When I turned on the light, she was trying frantically to jump up on the bed. She wasn't willing to let her feet touch the floor. Get my clothes, she said. Get my clothes. I felt something on my back. That was the last I ever saw of her. As soon as I graduated college and got my B.A., I taught sixth grade for six months in Spanish Harlem. It was a fine experience in some ways, and less satisfactory in others, but it didn't last long. Then I started working for the Puerto Rican Interagency Council as the assistant to the director of a government research and demonstration project called Improved Services to Puerto Ricans in Northeastern USA and Puerto Rico. The project was a way to track government funds and how they actually went through the government and local authorities, and to determine whether they did actually get to the Puerto Rican population. Because of a government rule, I was the non-Puerto Rican working in there. But as it happened, the director liked me enough because I could do anything. As I said, I could work the mimeograph and the hectograph machines. I also used the offices after they were closed and on weekends to send out our mailers. I used the typewriter and the layout and the stencils, and Peter knew a printer downtown. Ace did nothing. So we were able to put together a very professional-looking promotional package with a photograph 
a one-page bio sheet, and everything else. I got the year-end issues of Billboard, Record World, and Cashbox, which were music industry trade magazines, and copied out a huge list of record company executives, managers, music reporters, and so on. Then I sent out our mailer. I must have sent out a thousand of these mailers to everybody and their cousin, and people responded. Because in those days, you didn't get professional-looking packages coming in off the street. Now, every band does it. But in those days, it was unheard of. I took something from every job I had. When I was a teacher, I learned how people took in new information and what kinds of information excited them. When I worked for the Interagency Council, I learned the importance of making a professional package. Just before the band took off, I worked for the Direct Mail Agency, a company that invites people to send them complaints about wanting to be taken off mailing lists for junk mail. The DMA then puts together a list of these people and sells it to the junk mail companies so that they can save money by not bothering to send their junk mail to the people who have already identified themselves as unreceptive customers. They're making the junk mail people more market savvy. We were primed to break. All we needed was one final stroke of luck. Paul and I took the step of planning a Friday the 13th show at the Diplomat Hotel, which was on 43rd Street, a block from the 42nd Street subway. It was a rundown hotel, but it had a grand ballroom. We had no stature on the local scene. While other bands were making the rounds playing these clubs, we were in our loft practicing. So we needed this show to be a big deal. Paul and I arranged to get The Brats, a big local band that could pull 300 people wherever they played. They looked like larger Italian versions of the faces. A cross between the mods and the mob. We met with them and I told them that they had to go on at 11 p.m., no sooner. We paid them $350, which was a lot of money. There was another local band, Luger, that had a small following, and we made them go on at 8 p.m. and paid them $150. Then we took out newspaper ads and made flyers. Our total cost was about $1,000. We were counting on a crowd of 750 or maybe 1,000, each paying about $4 a ticket. Since we had done most of the organizing ourselves, we stood to make a decent amount of money from the show. But it wasn't about the money. I had read that Elvis's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, had actually banned Elvis's hips from television. It wasn't the network that did that. It was Parker. Because he wanted people to make a to-do about it. He manipulated the media and the audience. We were trying something similar. On our own, KISS couldn't pull any tickets. But with these other bands, we could. I wasn't a lawyer, and we couldn't afford one. But I composed and typed up contracts that restricted the movements of these other bands, contracts that required them to appear on stage at a certain time and not before or after. The whole place would be ours for a key window. When the invitations went out, they read, Heavy Metal Masters, Kiss, and we sent along complimentary tickets, backstage passes, and so on. According to the invitations, we would appear on stage at 9.30. We figured that the record executives wouldn't be able to separate the crowd. Even though everybody was coming to see The Brats and Luger, we could pretend they were there for us. Then we went into phase two of our plan. We packed the front row with sisters and girlfriends, wearing Kiss t-shirts, which we made at home. Paul and Peter stayed up one night and poured glue and glitter through a Kiss stencil, which was good for only two or three wears. Ace did nothing. So the entire front row was filled with girls wearing these black t-shirts with Kiss on them. The place filled up with record company executives and producers, just everybody, including Bill O'Coin, the producer of Flipside and Supermarket Sweep, a game show. Before MTV, before anything else, Flipside was a groundbreaking show for televising popular music. When he arrived at The Diplomat, he saw a rabid crowd of a thousand people, including the girls in the front, 
and the band hitting the stage at 9.30 sharp in full makeup, sticking out their tongues, you can imagine the effect. By that time, we had already done some recording on our own. Ron Johnson at Electric Lady owed us some money for the sessions we had worked on, and he'd asked if we wanted to take the money or use it to do a demo tape of our new band. Paul and I jumped at the offer to do a demo, on the condition, we said, that we got to work with Eddie Kramer. Eddie had engineered Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, Humble Pie, and lots of other big-name rock bands. He was already a legitimate guy. So he engineered our tape of five songs. We now had a professional-sounding tape, plus an event. So if Bill Coyne and some of the other people came and saw us and said, we're interested, can we hear a tape? We could put a tape on the table that would blow them away. It sounded like a record, and we had it in hand when we went to do the Diplomat show. When Bill Coyne came over to talk to me after the show, I still had my makeup on, and one of the girls I had been seeing was sitting on my knee. She thought I was just flirting with her, but I was completely aware that I had to have the garnish around the food, otherwise it wouldn't look as good. So while he was talking to me, I was in full makeup with a girl wearing a Kiss t-shirt sitting on my lap and cooing in my ear. Bill Coyne didn't know that I already had a relationship with her. He didn't need to know. A coin asked us if we had a management contract. I said no. We were naive, as it turned out, because the contract we had signed with Ron Johnson was also a comprehensive management contract. But we were also lucky because the contract was up. We were free to sign with a coin, and we did. When we joined up with Bill, we also joined up with another guy who would be influential in the early development of the band, a guy named Sean Delaney. Sean was a fairly young guy who had tried to have his own career in rock and roll. He had a band called the Scat Brothers. The Scat Brothers never made it, and he became a part of Bill Coyne's management company, which was called Rocksteady. Paul and I thought that we had a pretty good idea of what we wanted to do with KISS, but we didn't know the first thing about turning our vision into a career. That's where Bill and Sean came in. Without them, we were a high-spirited young band with enough enthusiasm to carry us along for a while. With them, we were poised to become superstars. Nothing to Lose, The Birth of Kiss, 1973-1974. The band was designed as a democracy. That was the blueprint. It was the Beatles model, but like the Beatles, it was clear that Paul and I were in the front seat because we were writers, and Ace and Peter were in the back seat. Paul and I didn't think of ourselves as leaders necessarily. When we met Bill Coyne, he recommended a four-way split. In order to keep things smooth, he said, we should divide the money equally. Better to do that, he said, than to quibble over shares and half shares. Plus, if everything went according to plan, there was going to be plenty of money for everyone. We took Bill's advice. Whenever there were decisions, we made them democratically, which didn't always make sense. If Paul and I wanted to do something and Ace and Peter didn't, we were in a stalemate. To get our way, we had to emotionally batter them, and often they felt as though Paul and I were ganging up on them. That may have been the perception at times. The truth was that Ace and Peter simply were not qualified to make decisions about band matters that depended upon organization and structure. They were not willing to put in the time to think things through. We would have a meeting about a tour or a photo shoot, and the very next day Peter would come up to me and say, Gene, when are we going to have a meeting about the tour? We had it, I said. Yesterday. You were there. Yeah, he would say, but I didn't understand anything you were saying. In this respect, Bill was more like me and Paul. I didn't realize it immediately, but Bill was gay. Paul knew it from the start. I didn't see it. Paul asked me if I minded having a gay manager. I said, no, why do you ask? I was oblivious to it. Bill's appearance and style were clearly suited for the corporate world. He dressed in suits and ties and presented himself well. He would show up with a beautiful blonde every now and then. He was not, for lack of a better word, a queen. 
Over time, I got the sense that something else might have been happening in his life. At any rate, it wasn't something I minded or have ever minded. He did the work he needed to do. He focused on the band. That was all that mattered. We also met Joyce Biowitz, who would co-manage us with Bill. She would later marry Neil Bogart. She was a powerhouse. Once we had Bill's attention and Sean's help, we went from nothing, playing our Friday the 13th show at the Diplomat Hotel, to a record deal in about three weeks. This is where Neil Bogart entered the picture. Neil Bogart had been born Neil Bogatz and grew up as a poor Jewish kid in a rough section of Brooklyn. He had always wanted to be in show business, and after attending the High School of the Performing Arts, that's the school in the movie Fame, he worked as a singer on a cruise ship and had some odd jobs as an actor. Eventually, he came back to New York and went to work for an employment agency. Soon, he was in the record business, first at MGM Records as a promo man, then at Cameo Parkway, then at Buddha. He was still a young kid at this time, about 25 years old. At Buddha, he started the careers of bubblegum bands, like the Ohio Express, who recorded Yummy, 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 and Chewy, Chewy. In 1973, with the help of Mo Austin at Warner Brothers, Neil started his own label. When Bill heard about this, he sent our demo tape over to Neil immediately. Kenny Kerner and Richie Wise, a popular production team who had worked on big rock and roll records, Brother Louie by Stories, and Imagination by Gladys Knight and the Pips, among others, heard the tape and told him they would love to produce Kiss. As a result of their enthusiasm and his own, Neil signed us without ever having seen us. Bill kept explaining to him that he had to see the band live, that the stage show was an integral part of our act, so finally, Neil arranged for us to play in front of him at Latang Studios at 54th Street and 7th Avenue. It was a small room with about 20 people, and we came out wearing makeup and played at maximum level. We blew out everybody's ears. It was an absolutely ferocious performance, and at one point, I jumped off the stage and ran up to Neil and forced his two hands to clap together. He must have been scared out of his mind, because with the heels on, I was close to seven feet tall, and he was about 5'7". And by the end of it, he was so overwhelmed that he was exhausted. He had two concerns. First, that the makeup was going to get in the way of the band's success. He thought the glam thing was over. More specifically, he worried that we were projecting a gay vibe, particularly Paul. We talked to him for a while and explained our vision of the band, which was to go beyond glam to something else. As far as the gay thing went, our feeling was that we dressed the way we felt inside, and the gay vibe wasn't really part of that. In a strange way, our greatest asset was the fact that we took our look seriously. Superman wore tights and a cape, and no one ever questioned his sexuality because he didn't see his costume as campy or funny. It was just what superheroes wore. This explanation seemed to satisfy Neil. Afterward, we were talking to him about his new label. It's going to be called Emerald City, he said. I told him I didn't like it and that he should change it. There I was, a guy who had never recorded, telling the new label president that I didn't like the name of his company. He was taken aback. You don't? No, I said. I'm in a rock band. It sounds like the Wizard of Oz. No, he said, it's about magic. But when I think of the Emerald City, I think of a girl, of Judy Garland, going down the yellow brick road. He ended up changing the name to Casablanca. Neil came from a hit singles background, and more specifically from a show business mentality. He wasn't qualified to make musical decisions. For all intents and purposes, he might have been tone deaf. And he was never a pure music guy, but he was a concept guy. And his influence on our music was tremendous. Someone else would have wanted singles from every Kiss album. And that would have been correct according to the prevailing business models. But what we did, and by so doing, arguably became one of the biggest bands of all time right behind the Beatles for gold records by any group, yet without a number one single or album in our entire career, was to go steady. The Billboard chart is an indication of what a record did in only one week. A band can come in and have the number one record 
and then it's gone the next week. Neil pushed us for product. He made us go back into the studio and record albums to keep our name in stores, of course. He pressured us for hit singles, of course, but he also let us find our own pace, and we turned out to be marathoners. The guy who runs the fastest is not the guy who wins the race. It's the guy who keeps the steady pace. If our career was in good hands with Neil, our act was in excellent hands with Bill O'Coin. We rehearsed downtown at a rat-infested loft that Bill provided for us. He was very forward-thinking. He had been a television director and producer with his flipside show. Now he and Sean Delaney set us up with a video camera so we could see ourselves performing. Initially, we resisted. It sounded stupid. Why would we want to do that? But it was eye-opening. We actually saw ourselves and thought, wow, we look cool. I remember sitting there afterward in stunned silence with the rest of the guys and really feeling the effect. The other thing Bill did was to put Sean Delaney with us as a kind of coach. This happened very early on. We would do our stage act, and he would stand off to the side, stopping us at certain points. I don't recall whether he served as a choreographer or just observed us and told us what was working. But we had open lines of communication, and when he made a suggestion, he could show us exactly what he meant on the tape. We could see our act coming together and our poise growing by leaps and bounds. We knew we were part of something special. How did we know? From seeing other bands and realizing how much better we could be. Paul and I went to see other bands in concert, not as casual fans, but as students. If a band came out with a certain kind of lighting or built a certain kind of set, we would file that away in our minds and make a note to do better. At one point, we went to see The Who. They were touring behind Quadrophenia, and we went down to Philadelphia to see the show. Leonard Skinner was opening, and throughout their set, the audience was talking and milling around. Then The Who came out, and the entire crowd got to their feet and started pumping their fists in the air. Paul and I got up too, but it was mostly out of respect for what they had done. The truth was that we brazenly thought we could do better. We knew we could. The bands that struck us as having something special weren't necessarily the most popular bands. In fact, the one we kept returning to was Slade, the British glam rockers who had hits with Come On, Feel the Noise and Mama, We're All Crazy Now. We liked the way they connected with the crowd and the way they wrote anthems. But we knew they would never make it in America because they were just too British. In fact, the lead singer, Nadi Holder, was Welsh, and it was hard to understand anything he was saying. We wanted that same energy, that same irresistible simplicity, but we wanted it American style. The first Kiss album was recorded in September 1973 at Bell Sound Studios, which was on 54th and Broadway, in a not entirely reputable part of New York City. The studio was seedy and dirty, although it was easy to get to from the subway. Although Bell Sound had perfectly good equipment, it was a 24-track recording studio, its feel was totally different from Electric Ladies. That was a connoisseur studio built by Jimi Hendrix and treasured by professional musicians. Bell Sound was a commercial endeavor, and many different kinds of recording was going on there all the time. We got right to work. Paul and I were especially interested in paying attention to the process, learning how a record was created. Our producers, Richie Wise and Kenny Kerner, worked with us on the first two records, and they were great teachers, efficient, professional, without any illusions about what we were doing, which was trying to capture the energy of a live show on a vinyl disc. If there were any difficulties, I don't remember them, because I was so impressed that we were actually making a record. In fact, the strangest thing about that time was the change in my workday. I was accustomed to going to work at Vogue or at the Puerto Rican Interagency Council as a strap hanger. I would wake up at 6 or 7 and come into the city by subway. As soon as we started recording, I was able to sleep until 11, wake up and have a leisurely lunch, and then head into the studio. Of course, I wasn't coming back until late at night, 
but it felt like I was suspended in time. The studio work went quickly. Kiss worked then the way Kiss had always worked. The rhythm tracks went down first, and then later on we added vocals. The songs that we brought into the session included some reworked material from the Wicked Lester period, as well as some new compositions. Over time, that first album had really held up well, mainly because the songs were so strong. Firehouse, Strutter, Deuce, Cold Gin, and Black Diamond, amazingly, are all products of the same recording sessions. When the record was finished, we went to shoot the cover photo. Our image was extremely important to us, and we wanted to get it right. The record company had paired us up with Joel Brodsky, a well-respected rock photographer who had taken cover shots for dozens of acts, including Leslie West, The Naz, Gladys Knight and the Pips, Carly Simon, and the Ohio Players. He was best known for the cover of The Doors' Strange Days, a surreal carnivalesque shot with a strong man and a midget. He had a studio in Midtown Manhattan, and we all showed up there a little early because we wanted to leave time to get into makeup. From the second we walked in, things were different from what we were used to. First of all, we were accustomed to doing our own makeup, but they had hired someone to do it for us. That's why Peter's makeup is completely different on that first album from what it eventually became. But that was only a minor hiccup. Once we were all made up, Brodsky put us in front of the camera and then draped a black cloth over us so you could only see our heads. That was intentional. It was what we call the Meet the Beatles effect, just four heads coming out of the darkness. Then Brodsky asked us who wanted to hold the balloons. We didn't understand until he explained his concept. I get it, he said. You're clowns. I'll go get the balloons. It took us a while to explain to him that we were completely serious. It's easy to see why he was confused. Up until that point, you didn't have popular bands coming out with makeup on. Alice Cooper was a frontman in makeup, and obscure bands like Roy Wood's Wizard and Crazy World of Arthur Brown wore makeup, but to have a real rock band with four guys, all of them in makeup, was unprecedented. It didn't have as much in common with rock and roll as it did with the movies or Las Vegas. But we convinced Joel Brodsky that we were serious. The album was recorded, the cover photo was done, then Bogart suggested that the drums should magically levitate. And something else, one of us would have to spit fire. We gathered in a coin's office, and a magician stepped up and spit fire clear across the room. We were asked which one of us would like to do it during the concerts. No one else raised a hand. But I curiously found that my own right hand was thrust high in the air. The guys were happy I'd be the one. All we had to do now was wait and play as many shows as we possibly could. We joined the bill for a big New Year's Eve show at the Academy of Music, which later became the Palladium. They were a bunch of bands, including Iggy Pop and the Stooges, and a band called Flaming Youth, a name Paul later borrowed for a song. The headliner was Blue Oyster Cult. It was a very exciting time. I had a liaison with one of the girls in Flaming Youth, and I was in a rock band about to play its first show, we had yet to release our first album, and we had a half hour to go out there and do our stuff. We finally went on fourth, and we just killed the crowd. We played with fury from the first explosion of the opening chord of Deuce. By the third song, Firehouse, the stage was covered by fog. Sirens were going off, flashing lights were blinding people, and the entire place was on its feet, fists pumping in the air. And if they thought they had seen it all, we would give them more. I emerged from the fog in full kiss gear, carrying a sword with the hilt lit on fire and my mouth full of kerosene. I came to center stage and I spit out the kerosene. A huge ball of fire erupted out of my mouth and the audience went nuts. I stood there, legs spread apart, soaking in the adulation. It was then that I smelled something burning. I had wanted to look extra cool on our opening night, so I sprayed extra hairspray on my hair so it would really puff out. Sean Delaney ran out and wrapped my head in a wet towel, and they went out of their minds. We came, we saw, and we damn well conquered. We were the sensation of the show, 
and a few weeks later, when a British magazine called Sounds published a New Year's roundup of shows across the world, they printed a picture of me. It wasn't exactly fame yet, but it was getting closer and closer. Audiences would scream when we came on stage. We would be recognized in the street, and sometimes we would even be recognized by girls. When I was a freshman in high school, there was a senior girl who was one of the most popular girls in school. She was in the student government and was the president of this club and a member of that society. She was so stunning that when she walked by, I'd lower my head, only to bring it up a second later to check out her lines. Everything about her spelled arousal. So I was walking down 42nd Street after Kiss had been around for two or three years, and everybody knew us, especially in New York, and I heard this squeal in back of me and then this voice, Jean, Jean, it's me, it's me, it's me. I didn't recognize her at first, but then it came to me. She was still beautiful. I played it cool. Oh, I said, so you like the band? She nodded. Well, I have to go now, I said. You want to come over tonight? It was as simple as that. I'd love to, she said. And that night, I made up for all of those nights of imagined passion. Being in Kiss had its side benefits. Shout it out loud, on the road and on the rise, 1974-1975. In February 1974, the Michael Quattro Band dropped out of a tour in Canada. Michael Quattro was the brother of Susie Quattro, who made a name for herself as a glam rock star. As a result of their sudden departure, we were named the replacement band on the tour. It was only a few cities, and small Canadian cities at that, but it was a real tour, and that meant everything to a band that had never been out of the New York area. Within a week, we were on tour. The first place we went was South Edmonton in Alberta, and I had my first authentic groupie a girl with green hair. She didn't know who Kiss was. We were just a rock band. I grabbed her and she spent the night with me. I was in heaven. This girl was spending the night with me just because I was in a band. No courting, no relationships, no dates, no what does it all mean. The very thing that women want out of a relationship is this kind of heaviness of life and meaning. All I wanted was no meaning. 24 hours of experiencing life with a warm female body. Early on, the other guys in the band would tease me for not being selective. They would say, she ain't so hot, or I could have had her, but I didn't care. For me, it was not a contest. Your girl is prettier than mine, or mine is prettier than yours. All I cared about was satisfying my carnal needs. I always seemed to have the urge to merge. The lifestyle really appealed to me. Betting down a girl whose name I barely remembered was something I wanted to do all the time. Some girls seemed to have a kind of fascination with my tongue. Others had a fascination with the whole concept of kiss. In fact, more than one asked me to leave on my makeup and my costume while we went to bed, or to the bathroom, or to the floor of the dressing room. It wasn't always the bed. The band ran on adrenaline because we had nothing else to run on. We were in the back of a station wagon, four of us, and Sean Delaney was driving. We would torture him. Ace and Peter would strip off their pants and stick their dicks against the window of the station wagon we were touring in. Sean tolerated all of this. We checked into motels, and he was like a camp counselor. When we had girls, he would storm into the room and tell them to leave. Get out! These guys need to sleep. One time a girl wouldn't leave. Sean was pulling her by her hair, and she wouldn't leave. Fuck you, you can't tell me what to do. Then this other language poured out of him. With his body language, he was very flamboyant. But it was all so entertaining, brand new, new cities, new foods, grits. How y'all doing? What are you, on gun smoke? I had never heard that kind of language except on TV, and I thought cowboy hats went out in the 1800s. Even though the girls on the road were starting to pile up, I was still seeing a girl named Jan, off and on. And it was at her house that I heard our music for the first time on the radio. There was a DJ in New York at the time named Alison Steele. She went by the name The Nightbird, 
and she was the kind of DJ that they don't have anymore, the kind who would dig around in a pile of records until she found something she liked. I was over at Chan's house, down in her basement, in bed with her, and we were listening to the radio, and Alison Steele came out of one record and went into the next one. I thought it sounded pretty good, and it took almost a minute before I realized it was Kiss. A few weeks after that, the album came out in stores. This was in February 1974. Once our stage act was refined by the short tour, we were ready for our first big industry showcase, which was happening out in Los Angeles. Neil flew us out west and rented us cars, and for a little while we soaked up California. It was a new experience, the West Coast. All the girls were pretty. They had the sun in their hair, and the weather was always nice enough for them to show a little skin. The showcase would happen at the Century Plaza Hotel. Neil had packed the place with record executives and businessmen. They weren't sure what to expect, but it's fair to say that they weren't expecting Kiss. Soft rock was starting to become more popular at this time, and the bands that were on everyone's minds were acts like the Little River Band and John Denver. When we came out, their jaws dropped. By now we were used to this reaction, and we played it for all it was worth. That's what made it rock and roll, in some sense, scaring the suits. Neil loved it, but he realized we needed more exposure, and pretty soon he got us booked on a show called In Concert, which was hosted by Dick Clark. The other guests that night were Cool and the Gang and Melissa Manchester. That gives you some idea of how eclectic the rock and roll scene was at that time. There may have been bands who, before playing on these TV shows, mingled with the other bands and made friends. We weren't one of them. For starters, we were defiantly out of step with the times. The other thing that set us apart, though, was our makeup. We had to apply it ourselves, and it took a few hours. So the ritual of getting ready for the show actually prevented us from having much contact with the other bands. While we were getting ready for the show, Dick Clark came backstage to say hello to us. He shook our hands and wished us luck. To this day, he remains one of the classiest people I have ever met in the record business. I can't tell you how gratifying it was to be a young band and have Dick Clark treat us with respect. Paul and I have talked about that occasionally over the years, and it's been kind of a guide for us, especially in dealing with our fans. We try never to be rude, never to turn away kids looking for autographs. Being polite backstage, though, didn't mean that we weren't going to tear the roof off the place when we finally got on stage. We played three songs, Deuce, Firehouse, and Black Diamond, and each one was more powerful than the last. The show was absolutely wild. At one point, I went right at the cameraman while breathing fire, and on TV all you could see is my face approaching and then the ceiling, because the cameraman jumped off his platform and ran. We didn't see the show until two months later. By that time, we were back on tour in Asbury Park, New Jersey. After the show, we'd gone back to the motel to change before heading out for the night. Someone turned on the TV set, and there we were, on national television. That whole first tour was a blur. We were making $75 a week, which was nothing, although it seemed like all the money in the world, since we were making it playing music. We opened for many bands, for Savoy Brown and Manford Mann, for Foghat and Golden Earring, and we found it a proud tradition of being thrown off of tours. In part, this was because we would leave the stage a terrible mess when we were through with it, there would be fake blood all over, and parts of the set would be singed. Once while opening for Black Oak, Arkansas, I accidentally set a corner of their curtain on fire. Bands really wanted us off the tour, though, because they couldn't follow us. In theory, we were the opening act, and they were the headliners. But when we were finished with the crowd, they would have a stunned, uncertain look in their eyes. There was no way to go on after us. We felt triumphant on tour, like we were on our way to the top. But we didn't forget the people who helped us, particularly our road crew. One guy named Paul Chavria, my bass roadie, was a little tiny guy, no more than 5'5". Five, five. 
but he could be an attack dog. Once Paul Stanley was trying to get into the arena and a security guard wasn't letting him by, and Paul Chavria just lit into this guard like nothing you've ever seen. Then there was Junior Smalling, a big black guy who worked as our road manager. A guy named Moose loaded Ace's guitar, and another guy, one of our drivers, lost his life years later when he swerved to avoid a family on a bridge. They were characters, roadies like you'd expect to see in a movie, but they were amazing, competent, devoted, and uncomplaining, and we couldn't have done it without them. For a number of shows, we opened up for Argent, a band led by Rod Argent, who had previously been a member of the great British invasion band, The Zombies. Argent had charted with at least one huge hit, Hold Your Head Up, and the band had a number of albums under their belt. We were novices compared to them, and as the junior band, we had to follow lots of arbitrary rules, one of which was the No Encore Rule. According to Argent, we could go out there and play only eight songs, and then we had to close up shop. The only problem was that the audience wanted us for longer than that. Argent fixed that by shutting off our power after eight songs. We'd be playing our hearts out, and the crowd would be screaming along, and then suddenly the lights would go dead. It would be demoralizing. During one show, our set went well as usual, and the audience was in a frenzy. We got to the end of our eighth song, and they were screaming as loud as they could, and we all braced for the lights to go dead, but they didn't. They stayed on. So we played an encore, and the crowd was still screaming. At that point, we didn't really have any more songs, so we actually went back and replayed some of the songs from earlier in the set. Finally, after the third or fourth encore, we came off, drenched in sweat, completely confused about Argent's change of heart. It turns out that we owed our good luck to Junior Smalling, who had gotten into a little argument with Argent's road manager and pushed him into an anvil case and locked it shut. Needless to say, we were thrown off that tour, too. It was a wild time. Later in our careers, we would fly first class on our own jet, but in the beginning, we flew commercial with regular civilians. I remember talking to people about what I did. My hair was big and bushy. We wore platform heels with leather pants and studded belts with spiders encased in the belt buckles and black fingernail polish. What do you do, they would say. I'm in a band. What's the name of your band? Kiss. Oh, really? That's a strange name for a band. As the band became more and more successful, we got letters from people who were wearing our makeup. They started to get involved in the mystique. We soon realized that we had created alter egos. The fans wanted them, not us. They wanted Superman, not Clark Kent. So we started to hide our real faces, which only fueled the mystique. The first album was selling okay, 50 to 60,000 copies, thanks mostly to our touring. But Neil Bogart wanted to sell more, and he always had ideas for how to do it. One of his earliest ideas was for a kissing contest. This was an old radio and DJ gimmick, to sponsor a kissing contest and have a bunch of young couples come out to a mall or car dealership. They were marathons. The couples would kiss as long as they possibly could, with only five-minute breaks every hour. The way Neil saw it, we were perfectly positioned to capitalize on this phenomenon because of our name. He suggested that we re-record that old Bobby Rydell song, Twist in Time, which would be changed to Kiss in Time and used to promote a series of contests around the country. The winners would get two big prizes, an all-expense-paid trip to Hawaii and an appearance on the Mike Douglas Show, a daytime talk show on network television. It wasn't a song we would have chosen, but Neil was insistent. He was a real promoter, and he believed it would be a successful gimmick. We finally agreed, but only on condition that we rewrite the lyrics. It would have been a death sentence to record the song with the lyrics from the 60s. It wasn't our style or our time. Paul and I sat down in the studio with paper and pencil and remade the song to fit our fans, mentioning the cities where we were big, the places people wanted to hear about. Then we re-recorded it. The whole process took about an hour. All in all, I'd say that we went along with it reluctantly, 
It certainly wasn't rock and roll, and we knew that. But we managed to do a decent job recording it, trying to get as much of our personality into it as we possibly could. We also extracted a promise from Neil that the cover version of the song would never appear on any actual Kiss albums, that it would be a one-shot deal to promote the contest. Of course, it didn't work out that way. The song later found its way onto some albums and re-releases. As a promotional single, Kiss in Time was moderately successful. At the beginning of May, it was released. Nothing to Lose, a real Kiss song, was the B-side, and broke into the top hundred. Neil's master plan was for us to follow the regional kissing contests and appear with the national winners on the Mike Douglas show. Needless to say, we weren't the show's usual fare, and we played up our strangeness. One of the other guests was a comedian, Toadie Fields, and at one point she said, Who are you supposed to be? I'm evil incarnate, I said, giving my best scowl. No, you're not, she shot right back. You can't fool me. You're probably some nice Jewish kid from Long Island. She was a trooper. I later thanked her on my solo album. Nice Jewish kids or not, we performed Firehouse, and it was a real spectacle. Plenty of pyrotechnics, plenty of makeup, and so forth. As a performing group, we were hitting our stride. We were exhausted from touring, but we had careers to build, so as soon as the first album began to lag, we went right back into the studio to record our second, which was titled Hotter Than Hell. In many ways, it was a continuation of the first album. The songs were drawn from the same pool of material, mostly written by Paul and me, with a couple of contributions from Ace. We had written some on the road and used some from the original Kiss demo. The producers were the same, Kenny Kerner and Richie Wise, who had done a fine job on the first album and were easy to work with. In fact, there was only one difference between the first album and the second, but it was a big difference, a 3,000-mile difference because Kerner and Wise had moved out west to California, we had to follow them to cut the second album. The culture shock was tremendous. We felt out of place in a million small ways, because we were a New York band with New York attitudes. The record label rented us cars, but that was just asking for trouble. Ace and Peter drank too much and drove too fast and cracked up their cars, and I didn't drive at all. The one benefit was the girls. While we were recording, we lived at the Ramada Inn, and it was a real rock and roll hotel, with girls going up and down the halls all day in a swimming pool stuffed with them. We didn't spend many nights alone. Recording was smooth, more or less, although Peter and Ace were a handful. Ace had his usual problems showing up on time, and Peter was, as Peter has always been, deeply insecure about his role in the process. There's one song on there, Strange Ways, that was written by Ace, and while we were recording, Peter insisted on playing a long drum solo. It was the kind of thing that bands like Led Zeppelin were doing, but mostly in their live shows, and Peter was no John Bonham. It just didn't work. When we heard it, we all thought it was ridiculous, and we insisted that it come off the record. Peter dug in his heels. If the solo went, he said, he would quit the band. This wasn't the first time he had given us an ultimatum, and it wouldn't be the last. We responded to it the way we always responded to his ultimatums. We ignored them, cut the drum solo out, and did what we knew was best for the band. He didn't quit. Norman Seif, who had been a brain surgeon in Africa before he became a photographer, did the cover shoot for Hotter Than Hell. He was entirely competent and professional, but he was a guy who believed that when you do a photo session, you have to create a certain ambiance. He probably explained this philosophy to us on the phone, but before we went down to his studio, we didn't know quite what to expect. When we got there, it was like stepping into another world. He had a number of girls, and they were walking around half-naked with silver paint all over them. There were mirrors on the ceilings and pieces of furniture suspended from wires, the whole feel was very surreal, like the twilight zone. Everyone got drunk, except for me. Paul got so drunk that at the end of the shoot, we had to carry him out 
and lock him in the back seat of our car so he wouldn't wander away. The photo shoot was also interesting because a few days earlier, Ace had decided to see how well and how fast he could drive his car down a winding Beverly Hills mountain. As it turned out, he couldn't do it very well. He smashed up the car and his face. For the photo, we had to superimpose the left side of his made-up face over the scarred right side. The album was released in October 1974. It was the second album we had put out that year. And after its release, we went right back on the road. That meant more cities, more venues, and most of all, for me, more girls. By this time, I understood exactly what I wanted out of the touring experience. I wasn't drinking. I wasn't using drugs. I could stay in the hotel and watch TV, and I did plenty of that. But I had my limits. When I had had my fill, there was only one more thing to do, and that was to go out and chase Skirt. I got a reputation for being indiscriminate, and I suppose it was earned. I didn't have very specific tastes in women. If they were female and in my presence, I was interested. During that tour, though, I surprised even myself. In a conservative town in the Deep South, we had a limo driver who must have been in her 60s. She was a full-figured gal in a chauffeur's hat and uniform. I kept calling her Grandma, and she kept calling me Sonny. I must have been 25, 26 maybe. The next day at about 8 in the morning, there was a knock on the door. Who is it? Open up, Sonny, it's Grandma. What time is it? 8 a.m. I thought we weren't leaving until 10. You're not. Open the door, Sonny. So she came in and we were all over the floor, the bed, everywhere else in the room. And so help me God, in the limo on the way to the airport, the other guys in the band were looking at me because I must have smelled like a lobster. I wasn't saying a word. And she turned around while she was driving and said, Here's my 19-year-old daughter, or granddaughter, I don't remember which it was. She's coming into town. Want to hook up? Then the guys figured out what had happened, and they looked at me like I was crazy. Another time we were playing in Atlanta, and there was a policewoman off stage while we were running through our sound check. Afterward, she motioned to me with her finger. I walked over and said, Officer, you know you can't make me come with just one finger. I was being cocky. Very funny, she said. Then she asked me for my autograph. It's for my daughter, she said. She's fascinated by your tongue. I don't understand her tastes, but what am I going to do? Who are you trying to fool, I said. It's not your daughter, it's you. You want to come and get it? I'm in room 190. Naturally, I didn't expect anything, but later that night there was a knock on the door, and the woman was standing there in her full police outfit. When she walked in, it was like a scene from a movie. She took her hat off and her long hair fell down. Then she unbuckled her belt and took off her gun. Then the scene faded to black. The next day we both came downstairs and she was dressed like a policewoman again. The guys all lined up against the wall. It was as if someone had yelled, spread em. When I wasn't chasing girls, I was trying to keep Ace and Peter out of trouble. It took some doing, especially in Ace's case. Originally, Peter and Ace had room together, but after a while, they didn't get along. Peter asked me if I would mind if he roomed with Paul and I roomed with Ace. It didn't bother me. We were all in the same band. One night I was going down to the hotel bar to see if there were any girls for the taking. I asked Ace if he wanted to come along. Nah, he said. You go ahead. I'll be down in a little while. I went by myself, and of course there were girls, and I started talking to them. And after a while, though, I started to wonder where Ace was. I called up to the room, and no one answered. Then I got a little worried. I got one of the hotel managers, and we went to the room and knocked on the door, but there was no answer. Finally, we smashed open the door. Ace was in the bathtub, passed out, and slumped down with the water rising. His mouth was just above the water. He would have died in a minute. He smelled like a pickled herring. We pulled him out of the water, naked, and put him to bed. 
I stayed up all night to make sure he didn't roll over and fall to the ground, which he did anyway, or throw up and choke on his own vomit. By the next morning, I was exhausted. Ace wasn't. He bounded out of bed, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Hey, he said. I stayed in last night and went to bed early. What did you do? He didn't remember a single minute of the ordeal. Despite our best efforts, and we were still growing as a touring band, both in confidence and in ability, Hotter Than Hell wasn't a commercial success. The album barely made it into the top hundred, and soon Neil Bogart was calling for yet another album. This time we came back to New York to record it. It was called Dress to Kill, and Neil had decided that he would produce it with us back in New York at Electric Lady Studios. The objective for the third album was to push Kiss to a higher level. For previous albums, Neil had boosted sales with novelty singles or television appearances. This time he wanted an anthem. He told us he wanted a song like Sly and the Family Stones, I Want to Take You Higher, something that would get the whole audience involved, screaming, pumping their fists. Paul had an unfinished song he had been working on for months, and I had a piece of a song that I hadn't finished earlier. We put the two together, and before we knew it, we had this new song, which eventually became Rock and Roll All Night. The song was simple, which was very appealing, and it had a vocal chorus that was sung by a large group of people in the studio. Not just the four band members, but engineers, families of people from the record label, about 20 people in all. We felt the energy of it immediately. It was like those old Slade songs that we had liked when we were just starting out, but with this very accessible Middle America feel, we had a feeling it was going to be big. For the cover of Dress to Kill, we used a photographer named Bob Gruen, who had earned some fame for taking pictures of John Lennon and had worked with dozens of other rock stars. The original idea was to have us in full makeup on the streets of New York, but Bob thought that it might be more interesting to put us in makeup and normal business clothes. We liked the idea, but there was only one problem. None of us had normal business clothes. So we borrowed suits from people, and they weren't exactly perfect fits. If you look at the cover photo closely, you can see that my pant legs and jacket are a little too short and a little too tight. Dress to Kill was released in March 1975, and the single of Rock and Roll All Night went to radio a week later. It wasn't the success we had hoped for. It didn't do terribly. I think it peaked at number 68. But we had really thought that it might break us into a different level of radio play, and it didn't. At the same time, we were laying the groundwork for our next album. About a week after Dress to Kill was released, we made plans to record some live shows. There was already talk of possibly putting out a live Kiss album because we still felt that we were a much more powerful band on stage than in the studio. We loved being on tour, and it showed. I remember two sisters who showed up at my hotel room door in Indianapolis in early 1975, both of whom wanted to spend the night with me. The better looking of the two was noticeably pregnant. Despite that, we all stripped naked, got into the shower, and became fast friends. In another city after another show, I opened another hotel room door to find another lovely young lady. My guess was that she was 18. I always made it a point to ask the girls how old they were. It may not have been the most gentlemanly thing to ask, but my intentions were certainly honorable. She came in and quickly had her way with me and I with her. Then there was another knock at the door, and I yelled for whoever it was to leave. My young lady friend said that I could answer the door. It was okay with her. When I opened the door, a woman was standing there, attractive and in her early forties, who identified herself as the mother of my companion. I must have looked as if I'd seen a ghost, but the mother said there was no problem and asked me if it was okay for her to come in and join the fun. I looked over at my young lady friend, and she just giggled and nodded her head yes. Life was good. In a Midwestern city, I can't say which, but it's on a lake, 
a prominent radio promotion man invited Kiss to be his guests at his home for dinner. We were told to go because we needed radio support to sell records. The dinner was uneventful and quite boring until the promo guy got up and started making a long speech. Sitting across from me was his beautiful wife. When she brushed her high heels against me under the table, initially I thought it was accidental and moved my leg away. I had already arranged for a guest to meet me in my hotel after dinner and had no intention of coming on to this man's wife. She brushed up against me a second time and smiled suggestively. Then the promo guy took some of our guys on a tour of his home, and his wife quickly took me by the hand and led me to the far end of the house into a bathroom. There, she dropped to her knees and without a word showed me how fond she was of me. Some of the memories are bittersweet. When Kiss played Las Vegas for the first time, we had finished the concert and quickly made our way back to the Stardust Hotel. Standing in the lobby, waiting for the elevator, Peter nudged me and whispered, Wow, look at that girl over there. She was stunning. Long, blonde hair, short, tight miniskirt, and high heels. She smiled. I immediately reached out, grabbed her hand, and pulled her into the elevator with us. She came willingly. Neither of us said a word while the elevator went up to my floor. When we got inside my room, words didn't seem necessary. We devoured each other. Afterward, she told me her name was Star, that someday she would be a star and that her last name was Stowe. We stayed up all night, and when morning came and it was time to leave, she asked me what she should do. I remember saying something about sending photos of herself to you, Hefner. I was out of touch with her for about six months. Then one of our road crew showed me an issue of Playboy. The centerfold was Star Stowe. She described herself as a one-band woman and said some very nice things about me. I contacted her, and for a time, she was my companion on the road. We had terrific times. We went to movies together. We went to clubs. We ate. We danced. We couldn't keep our hands off each other. After a time, I lost touch with her. Years later, I ran into her at one of our concerts. She had been through some hard times, had not saved any money, and seemed sadder than I had ever seen her. Later on, I looked her up and was stunned to find that she had passed away. The God of Thunder, The Making of Destroyer, 1976 By 1975, Kiss had broken all the rules and records. We never had a hit single, and yet our double live album, Kiss Alive, had gone multi-platinum in an era when live albums simply didn't sell. We not only broke through with a live album, but with a double album to boot. The mystique had grown beyond even our own expectations. We had become our stage personas, the demon, the star child, and so on. Off stage, we were forced to hide our faces. Photographers were constantly trying to photograph us without makeup. There was a $25,000 price tag on my head. In some ways, we were trapped by what we had created. Initially, it was fun, but in short order, it became difficult. We couldn't go out in public without security. Bodyguards were often asking people to hand over film. Differences within the band started to come to the surface. Paul was more the classic rocker. He wanted to be a rock star, period. Ace and Peter had those notions as well, but they were never able to really verbalize just what they were all about. I wanted Kiss to be the best of all worlds. I loved comic books. I loved horror movies. I didn't have preconceived notions about rock bands and, quite honestly, didn't care. It wasn't enough to tour and be a recording artist. Somehow, Kiss should be about all these other areas as well. I may have been the impetus behind getting the band and management to start thinking about a Frank Frazetta piece of art for our forthcoming Destroyer album. Frazetta was the finest of the sci-fi fantasy painters, best known for painting all those Conan the Barbarian covers. I was a major fan. I asked the art department to reach the Frazetta estate. 
They contacted his wife, and then we found out the price tag. It was too much. We would need to find someone else. Ironically, we hit upon a cousin of Frazetta's, Ken Kelly, who was known to me through his creepy and eerie magazine covers. Kelly and the band met to discuss the concept. I remember suggesting we should be depicted in a Marvel Comics pose, like the Fantastic Four. So there we were, a rock and roll band, depicted on their new album without guitars. It was a major statement. We stood out from all the other bands. It said, in effect, we are more than the guitars we play. It was the pivotal point that sent a message out to millions of fans and press alike. We were also superheroes. The first version of the cover was done during the middle of the recording process. We stopped recording mid-record and went off on tour. We also decided to change the outfits. So by the time we finished Destroyer, the cover of the album depicted us wearing the wrong clothes. Ken Kelly had to go back and paint on the new costumes. Bob Ezrin was brought in to produce us. He was Canadian and had been successful with the Alice Cooper albums. Needless to say, we were fans of his work. He brought with him something we had never seen before. He had vision. He knew before the album was recorded what it should be. He rearranged songs. He co-wrote half-finished songs. He told Peter how to play his drums. He literally came up with the melody line for the entire solo of Detroit Rock City. He made Ace play every note and stick on the harmony parts. He suggested my bass line in the song. Neither Ace nor Peter was thrilled with the notion that some outsider was now telling them what to play, but the results speak for themselves. All the major decisions on the entire record, the sound loops, the children's choir, the kids on God of Thunder, Ezrin's kids, by the way, the string-based Beth and the song order were completely Ezrin's. The car crashing at the beginning of Detroit Rock City was a sound effect Ezrin brought in. Initially, some of us thought it was a bit melodramatic. Though we knew movies used sound effects with songs, we simply never thought about using the sound of crashing cars to open a song. But while recently listening to the Shangri-La's leader of the pack, sure enough, I heard a motorcycle crash in the background. Beth was written by Stan Penridge, mostly. It was credited to Peter Chris, Stan Penridge, and Bob Ezrin. In truth, Peter didn't play a musical instrument, drums, or a percussive instrument, and I have never seen him write a single song. Peter may have contributed a line of lyric or two, but after hearing the original Penridge demo tape of the song, it's clear who came up with the original song, which incidentally was called Beck, as in Becky. As a side note, Peter was having a hard time getting the vocal performance down. His pitch wasn't to Ezrin's satisfaction. Ezrin made the band leave the studio to give Peter a chance to concentrate. Eventually, the track was done, and we all stared at each other. There were no guitars played by the band on it. There were no drums on it, and Ace never showed up to play his part. In a very real way, Beth is simply Peter singing alone. There is not another piece of Kiss on there. We didn't know if it would upset the fans. The first single was Detroit Rock City. The B-side was Beth. In those days, the other side of a single would feature another song. Usually, it would be the song you would never imagine as a hit single because you didn't want to compete with yourself for a radio airplay. Detroit Rock City was not a hit record. We were all shocked to learn that radio stations were turning the record over to play Beth. It became our biggest hit at the time. It also won the People's Choice Awards, tying, by the way, with Disco Duck. God of Thunder was written by Paul. Most people think I wrote it. It was originally recorded in a demo form at Magna Graphics Studios in New York on 8-track with Paul singing and a disco beat. Ezrin rearranged the song, slowed it down, and suggested I sing it instead. Paul, to his credit, was very receptive. Both Paul and I would offer our songs to be sung by Ace and Peter, Paul, in particular, gave a few songs to Peter to sing. God of Thunder became my signature song for years. 
In what must have been an inspirational moment, I decided I should throw up blood during the beginning of the song so that I could look the part. Destroyer was released and initially stalled at sales of around 890,000 copies. We were on tour, and although the fans came out in droves to see their heroes, the record just stood still. Then Beth became a hit and everything around us exploded. We were invited to do the Paul Lynn Halloween special, which meant national television exposure. We appeared on the show with Margaret Hamilton, the original witch from The Wizard of Oz. We also noticed that the world had changed. All of a sudden, you could walk down the street and people would be walking by wearing Kiss t-shirts. We had arrived. Ezrin's recording style was leagues beyond anything we had seen. In some ways, it seemed like a throwback to a previous era. But in other ways, it was clear he knew what he wanted and how to get it. Records are recorded by separating all the different elements into tracts. You can move a fader and only hear the guitar or the snare drum. Once everything was recorded on a 24-track machine, you then added effects like echo or chorus and mixed it down to a stereo mix. What you hear at home is a mix. Ezrin would record two or three guitars, add effects, and submix them, which means there was no turning back. He would commit to a sound very early on. It further solidified the notion in my mind that he had a vision. Destroyer also marked the first time we tried experimentation. Peter's drum set was set up in the loading area in back of the studio for one of the tracks. His drums faced an open elevator shaft. Microphones were placed close to the drums and at the end of the elevator shaft. That way, the sound would come back like thunder. Peter was separated from the rest of us, so a video camera was set up to film him. This was still at the early stages of video, so it all seemed very science fiction to us. On one of the takes, Peter stopped playing, and when we looked up, there was a guy carrying out the garbage into the elevator nearby. Flaming Youth was probably the most difficult song to record. It was composed of a title Paul had, which he lifted from a band we had opened up for called Flaming Youth. A verse and a chorus that Ezrin, Paul, and I tossed back and forth, and a bass riff I had from an old song called Mad Dog. Ezrin put all the pieces together and then threw a bizarre time signature at us, which was torture for a basic drummer like Peter. Peter never counted bars of time. He had never done it and, in fact, didn't understand the fundamentals. Ezrin had to start from the beginning. Where was the one and where was the two? And then he had to teach Peter, in particular, what a bar of music was, how long it lasted, and how one counted it. He also tried to crystallize what a chorus and a verse were. All this education made Peter very irritable. It was also very time-intensive. We were used to going into the studio, not thinking too much about technicalities, and just doing it. We had never encountered anything like this. Kiss was a rock and roll band. We were unschooled, self-taught musicians. We got through the song, but it had to be done in pieces and then edited together. Shout It Out Loud was written in Ezrin's apartment. Paul and I had gone over to play new material. Ezrin sat down at the piano. Paul had a guitar and suggested a few changes. When there was a basic verse idea, I suggested Shout It Out Loud, as in Shout It, Shout It, Shout It Out Loud. This wasn't a unique idea. Wicked Lester had recorded a song we never put on the album called We Want to Shout It Out Loud, written by Cook and Greenaway. The demo was originally done by the Hollies. They never used it. We tried to record it, but it never made it to the final stages. I had always loved the notion of shouting anything, as in Shout, by the Isley Brothers. Shout It Out Loud seemed like a natural follow-up to rock and roll all night where rock and roll all night proudly proclaimed I wanna as the key idea, shout it brought the fans into the party. Well, the party's begun and you want some fun. Great Expectations was a song I had written initially about the band. The original lyric went something like, 
You watch Paul playing guitar, and you see what his hand can do, and you wish you were the one he was doing it to. And you watch me singing this song, and you know what my mouth can do, and you wish you were the one I was doing it to. Ezrin thought the song was too self-serving if it talked about the band. Although Beth was very clearly about the band. Beth, I hear you calling, but I can't come home right now, because me and the boys will be playing all night. I would have preferred to have the band names mentioned in the song. I had fondly remembered Beatles songs and hearing, Take it, George. When Destroyer came out, Kiss became the biggest band in America. We went from opening up for other bands to headlining at Anaheim Stadium in California with opening acts like Bob Seger, Uriah Heep, and Ted Nugent. We had billboard and television commercials. Coming soon were the Kiss makeup kits and lunchboxes. While almost every record we recorded in our 30-year history has elements I would change, in retrospect, Destroyer is an album I wouldn't change. I might do away with the sound loop at the top of the first song, but other than that, I wouldn't change a thing. Kiss has played thousands of concerts. We have added and dropped songs from our set list purely as a response to what the fans seem to like. Destroyer has stood the test of time. More than any other record we ever recorded, it probably defines what the band is and what it stood for. The songs on it, Detroit Rock City, Shout It Out Loud, God of Thunder, and others, continue to be a staple of our live shows. Rock and Roll All Night, Alive and Destroyer, 1975-1976. The relative failure of the rock and roll all night single disappointed us slightly, but it didn't scare us because we knew exactly what we had to do. We had to go right back on the road, which was where we were strongest and connected with our audience most powerfully. This time, there was an extra wrinkle. We had decided to record some of the shows and release them as a live album. We had the three studio albums, but we never felt as though they captured the band. They were merely documents. For the full KISS experience, we needed to let fans have a taste of our live show. Not only the theatrical elements, but the power of the band. The recordings that would become alive were drawn from a number of concerts, including shows in New Jersey and Iowa. The majority of the album, though, was taken from a late March show at Cobo Hall in Detroit. In some ways, the decision to tape the Detroit concerts was the easiest one we ever made. A city is never just a city. It is always defined by the people who live in it and by what they do for a living, which then in a very real way affects their lifestyle. Because New York is a cosmopolitan city, it was the birthplace of Studio 54. Southern cities were more repressed in some ways and wilder in others. Detroit being the hub of the auto industry, was anti-fashion, much more meat and potatoes. I wouldn't be surprised if McDonald's sold more hamburgers in Detroit than anywhere else. It's very blue-collar, a real middle American metropolis. The big stars that emerged out of Detroit through the late 60s and early 70s, the MC5, Ted Nugent, Bob Seger, and Grand Funk Railroad, were similar bands, loud and passionate, with minimal pretension and a bit of grittiness. Detroit is all about no-nonsense music. From our very first record, Detroit had taken us to heart immediately. People in New York and Los Angeles misread us. They affected a certain sophistication and felt that we weren't up to their standards. But Detroit understood our mix of fun and energy from the start. After the Detroit show, we were presented with an award and went to a party thrown in our honor. There was plenty of action at the party, lots of booze, music, and women. I wasn't interested in the booze. I had had my fill of music for the day, and I even had my female companion for the night, a writer from Cream Magazine who was doing a feature article about the band. I was ready to leave with her when I spied the waitress moving through the crowd with a plate of brownies. My sweet tooth got the better of me, and I pounced on those suckers. 
I must have eaten six or seven of them before I had my fill. Within five minutes, I became Gene in Wonderland. Immediately, my head shrank to the size of an apple. My feet ballooned to the size of boards. My hands grew bigger. The longer I stared at them, I grew frightened, took the hand of my female companion, and ran out to the waiting limo. Once inside, I became very thirsty for milk. I had to have some. And within a block of the concert hall in a seedy part of Detroit, we pulled up to an all-night diner. Inside, it was quiet and there were a few people with their heads down, either eating or drinking coffee. I stepped up to the counter, thinking that my voice couldn't be heard because my vocal cords must have shrunk along with my head. I screamed at full volume, May I have a glass of milk, please? It scared the pants off the waitress. Everyone at the place, now startled, looked up. I was embarrassed. I thought they were all looking at how small my head had gotten. I left the diner, dove back into the car, and thanked God my female companion knew where the hotel was. She got us there, and as I was walking down the hallway, propped up by her, every step felt as though I was walking through a funhouse mirror. When we got to the door of my room, I couldn't fit my key in the lock. My key was now the size of an anvil, and the keyhole no bigger than the eye of a needle the only saving grace that night, when we finally got into bed, was that I was finally proud of my manhood and couldn't imagine anything getting bigger. Alive almost did not come out. Casablanca had taken a bath on a record called Best Moments of the Tonight Show, a double album that consisted of highlights from Johnny Carson's talk show. Ironically enough, this record was put together by Joyce Biowitz, our former co-manager, and the woman who would soon be Mrs. Neil Bogart. Even though we were the label's prize act, there wasn't a whole lot of money to go around. There have always been rumors that the Alive record was substantially reworked in the studio. It's not true. We did touch up the vocal parts and fix some of the guitar solos, but we didn't have the time or money to completely rework the recordings. What we wanted and what we got was proof of the band's rawness and power. Alive was released in September 1975 and immediately moved up the charts. Sales eventually went to four million. Amazingly, the live record produced our first big single, a concert version of Rock and Roll All Night. Almost overnight, we went from being a working band with a record contract and a devoted following to being national superstars. The lasting effect of the live album went beyond KISS. In fact, it affected the entire rock industry. Before Alive, bands didn't really release concert albums as legitimate product. They were almost always put out to fulfill contracts. We were one of the first bands to really care about the idea and to package it accordingly. When the album came out, it had a gatefold showing all three studio albums and pictures of handwritten notes from all the band members. Within three years, many more of these elaborate live packages appeared, including Frampton Comes Alive and Cheap Trick at Budokan, which included a little homage to us in a song called Surrender, with the lyric, Rock and Rolling Got My Kiss Records Out. Live records became mandatory for 70s superstars, and we led the way. After the massive success of Alive, we knew that we had to deliver a grand statement. We wanted a studio record that would top all our previous efforts. To achieve that, we brought in Bob Ezrin, who was already well known as a producer for his work with Alice Cooper and would later produce Pink Floyd's The Wall. We started recording in the record plant in New York in January of 76, only five months after the release of Alive. Up until we met Bob Ezrin, we were leery of letting anybody else have a say as to what we should record. That included management, record companies, producers, anybody. Bob Ezrin was the first and continues to be the only producer who ever really had an effect on the band. It's hard to say why we let Bob have so much control, yet it's also easy. It wasn't about his track record. It's never about a track record. 
It's more about the fact that when somebody has an idea and can communicate that idea as effectively as Bob, they automatically command a certain respect. Other bands have stories about meeting up with producers who teach them how to be professionals. Before these producers came along, they were noble savages, beating on their guitars and just hoping for the best. It wasn't like that with Kiss. We had known what we were doing since the beginning. Bob didn't make us go faster. In fact, if anything, he slowed the process down considerably. But it was the way he slowed it down that was impressive. At one point, I remember him stopping us in the middle of a rehearsal. Okay, he said. Do you guys know how to tune your instruments? We were all self-taught musicians. We said, of course, here's how you tune them. He frowned. No, he said. There's another way to tune instruments, which is pitch perfect. It's called harmonic tuning. And he showed us how to do it, which we had never seen in our lives. It was like going back to school or to summer camp. He carried a whistle around, and whenever he wanted to get our attention, he would say, Campers? Every time we thought we had done enough to satisfy him, he would come at us with something else. In some ways, he was quite a disciplinarian. When he didn't think we were getting a handle on something, he would send us outside the studio. Paul and I were excited because we knew the experience was making the band better. We were rubbing our hands together thinking, oh boy, this is going to a place we haven't been. It was a really good adventure because we recognized that whatever we were doing, even though it was a step forward, it still sounded like Kiss, but better than before. We literally heard the record coming together there in the studio, and it was the best version of the band to that point. Much of the success of Destroyer had to do with Bob's bravery, particularly his interest in introducing new elements into our music. Bob's children would come in. He was going through a divorce at the time, and they actually wound up as the little voices in God of Thunder, he was doing all kinds of things, like having symphony orchestras and choirs. What George Martin was to the Beatles, Bob Ezrin was to us. He had something that we had never seen before in a producer, a vision. He knew where he was going within the confines of what Kiss was, and most important, he knew how to get there. While Paul and I had perspective and vision, we didn't quite know how to get there because we were limited as musicians. There was one thing we did know, though. We wanted to create an experience that went beyond the experiences that other rock bands were creating. Bob really listened to our songs and recognized that we were less about storytelling than about singing about our own feelings and perceptions. I'm the king of the nighttime world. I want to rock and roll all night. That was a quantum difference. I am the god of thunder. These were the kinds of statements we specialized in, and they differentiated us from other bands. When we spoke to Bob about this, he realized that the simplicity and self-absorption in the lyrics was purposeful, that we were a band with a distinct point of view rather than just a set of guys who didn't have a clue. We wanted to write anthems, songs that felt like the theme songs for a generation, songs that had a you-and-me-against-the-world perspective. As much as Paul and I loved working with Bob, Ace and Peter hated it. For the first time, they couldn't take the easy way out. Ace was not about discipline. He wouldn't even show up on time. And nobody had ever sat Peter down and said, here is a two and a four. He has never been able to articulate his own playing. Give me a one and a three on a kick and a two and a four on the snare. He wouldn't have a clue what that meant. And to this day, he doesn't know what a two or a four is. Peter has always played by feel and couldn't play the same thing twice. As a result, Bob Ezrin's time with the band was very tough for Ace and Peter, or at least that's how they saw it. Peter, in particular, was devastated by it. He had never had any discipline. He was a street kid. Paul and I had always been critical of Ace and Peter because they didn't get the big picture, and here was this guy from the outside doing the same thing only ten times more intensely. Paul and I used to talk about who was taking the experience harder. In retrospect, I think both of them were feeling quite defeated, although their feelings manifested in different ways. 
Peter would come out furious that somebody was telling him what to play or how to sing and that that's not rock and roll. It was the same personality that made him threaten to leave the band if we didn't include his strange way solo back in 74. Ace would simply leave. Sometimes he wouldn't show up at recording sessions. On one occasion, he wanted to leave early because he had a card game at 7 that evening. At some point, Bob didn't worry about Ace or his excuses. He simply got another guitar player to come in and play Ace's parts. Mainly, he was a guy called Dick Wagner who played with the Lou Reed Band. He was not credited, and to this day, people think it's Ace on the album. Ace felt as if Paul and I especially were traitors, and that we told Bob Ezrin to get another guitar player because we never wanted him in the band anyway. Yet we were the ones who brought him into the band, pushed him to write his own songs, and asked him to be more than a guitar player and sing his own songs. He was oblivious to that and continues to be. During the recording of Destroyer in 1975, I had another drug experience. Not an experience in which I took a drug, but the first time I ever saw cocaine cut up and ready to be snorted. A mirror was built into the control console at the recording studio, and I was clueless about its purpose. I kept on saying, look how stupid this is. You have to bend down to see your face. The least they could do is hang it up on the wall, and everybody would laugh but nobody ever told me what it was for. At the time, I was using sweet and low in my coffee because I've always loved desserts but wanted to lose weight. One day I walked in, and there was powder on the mirror, and I was so oblivious to everything about drugs that I assumed it was sweet and low. I made myself some coffee, and I brushed some of the stuff on the console into my cup. Then I thought twice about it and said to myself, that's probably got some dirt and stuff. One of the engineers explained it to me. No, that's cocaine. You cut it up. You snort it with a straw. That's stupid, I said. It seemed so stupid to me, in fact, that I actually took sweet and low and spread it on the control console. I don't know if anybody took it or not, but I thought that was a funny thing at the time. While we were recording Destroyer, we spent a lot of time in the studio, more than we ever had. During the course of those sessions, I'd be plugging one of the girls who worked there. I would say, excuse me, guys, I gotta go pee, and slip away to fuck her pants off. On one occasion, I snuck her into a vocal booth and laid her down. I ravenously went at her and she at me until she stopped, patted me on the back, and pointed to the window portal. Ezrin and the band had seen the whole thing. Paul then got the message and started doing her. We were on swing shift. After Kiss played a concert in Flint, Michigan in 1975, Peter and I were in limousine together, and he was trying to sing something he called Beck, about a girl named Becky. I suggested that he change the name to Beth, both because it was a little easier to sing and because it would eliminate any misunderstanding that it was about Jeff Beck. Peter brought this nice little melody into the studio and sang it for Bob. Immediately, Bob sat down and fleshed it out. He had a much wider musical library than any of us. He listened to jazz, to classical, to country. He stuck in a middle eight from a Mozart piano concerto, rewrote the lyric, and suddenly we had a song. But we really didn't know what to do with it. Rock bands didn't do ballads least of all in the midst of a concerted push for rock and roll credibility. The only way we validated the idea that there were strings on it was because of Yesterday by the Beatles. If it was cool for the Beatles, then we could do it. The first few singles from Destroyer hadn't done quite as well as we wanted. Shout It Out Loud was the first single, and it got into the top 40. Then the label released Flamin' Youth, with a special picture disc, but that only got to number 74. The third single was Detroit Rock City, with Beth, this strange, unclassifiable ballad on the B-side. We had high hopes for Detroit Rock City, but it didn't even chart, and the album, which had reached as high as number 11 and sold about 850,000 copies, was beginning to taper off. That's when something strange started to happen. Radio stations turned over the record and started playing Beth instead of Detroit Rock City, and it quickly became a huge hit. 
Beth was a breakthrough single, establishing the record. Now, rather than having a hit with a live record and then sinking back down, we were riding the crest of two massive hit records. In pop music, this has been the way to create superstars from stars. And sure enough, we were superstars. Soon after Destroyer came out, we played our first stadium, Anaheim Stadium in California, which held 55,000 fans. If it hadn't happened to us, we wouldn't have believed it. This was early 1976, only two years after we released our first record, and there we were playing stadiums before anyone other than the Beatles had. Bands that had been around for almost a decade, including Ted Nugent and Bob Seger, were opening for us. We knew something was going on. It was clear. The first burst of fame coincided with the first wave of Kiss merchandise. I had always seen the band as a means to an end. In my mind, making music was only part of the plan. The master plan was to create a cultural institution that was as iconic as Disney. From the very beginning, we were at the forefront of rock and roll merchandising. We had the usual products like t-shirts and posters, but we also had an interest in expanding into other markets. We grew to the point that Bill Coin actually bought a share in a company called Boutwell, and we wound up in manufacturing. Warehouses in the Southern California Valley were manufacturing our own t-shirts, belt buckles, and stuff. Mail order forms were enclosed inside the records. We did things other bands wouldn't have had the balls to do. The same things you see when you buy Time magazine. There's an order form inside. From the start, we didn't care that it invalidated what we did. We were not concerned with credibility. It just looked like a lot of fun. As time went on, some bands took a stand against this kind of thing. Primarily, they came from the big art rock movement in New York. We always thought they were geeks. It was as if, all of a sudden, the guys who never got laid in school put guitars around their necks. They didn't count for us. They didn't look like stars. They looked like students. And they always talked about stuff we couldn't care less about. Burning buildings? What are you talking about? All of a sudden, we were one of the biggest bands in the world. In the mid-70s, a lot of the bands we grew up with were not exactly at their peak. The Stones were not. The Who were not. And we were outselling them more than two to one. Bands like Queen were huge worldwide, but in America they didn't tour much. We didn't have many peers. At that time, misinformation about the band began to spread in the southern Bible Belt states, including a rumor that the name Kiss stood for Knights in Satan's Service, and that the four of us were devil worshippers. Ironically, this rumor started as a result of an interview I gave in Circus Magazine after our first album. In response to a question, I said that I sometimes wondered what human flesh tastes like. I never wanted to really find out, but I was curious intellectually. Later on, this comment seemed to ignite the whole idea that in some way Kiss was aligned with devil worship. When I was asked whether I worshipped the devil, I simply refused to answer for a number of reasons. The first reason, of course, was that it was good press. Let people wonder. The second reason was my complete disregard for the people who were asking. The religious fanatics who were asking these questions didn't deserve the time of day. The uneducated always point to religious principles. Through the years, whenever religious fanatics accosted me, especially in the southern states, and quoted the Old Testament to me, I would quote them back chapter and verse. They didn't know that I had been a theology major in school. An idiot is an idiot, whether he quotes the Bible or not. Fueling the fire for the Satan-worshipping nonsense was my hand signal, which involved the pinky, the thumb, and the index finger. This started innocently enough during concerts. I'd hold the pick with my thumb and my two middle fingers. Some people mistakenly thought it was a gesture of some kind, so they started waving their index and pinky fingers toward me in return. The second part of the hand signal came from my love of Spider-Man. In the comics, he sometimes had his middle finger pressed against the inside of his palm. 
I copied that in an early photo, and the fundamentalists seized on it. In point of fact, the hand signal actually means I love you in sign language, though I didn't know that at the time. This hand signal, ironically enough, became a standard gesture for other heavy metal bands and their fans, and it has been in constant circulation ever since. I was getting the hang of handling magazine reporters. A Rolling Stone writer wanted to do a story on the band. He came up to a duplex I was renting on Riverside Drive in New York to interview me for what he said would be a cover story. When I met him, I was very careful to cultivate the demon mystique. I wore all my spider and silver jewelry and my leather pants. I puffed up my hair as big as it would go. With my seven-inch platform boots with silver dollar signs on them and black nail polish, I thought I was ready to project a perfect badass rock and roll image. He was right there with me through this entire interview. Then at one point the door buzzer sounded, I answered it, and in the doorway was my mother with enough food to feed the world. Fresh hot soups, veal cutlets, pancakes, jams, cakes. She insisted that he and I, I think she called us hungry boys, stop what we were doing and eat. She kept calling me by my Hebrew name, Chaim, and told the writer I was a good boy. The big bad demon was just a mama's boy. Being a mama's boy, though, has never kept me from chasing the ladies. I bedded down one girl after another. There was no end to them. They were in every hotel room, every backstage area, every limousine. At one point, I found out that the carpenters were staying in the same hotel. I called Karen Carpenter, who was staying a few floors below me, and left my female guest in my room to go down there with the idea of seducing her. Karen was certainly playful enough on the phone with me, very giggly, very friendly, and very suggestive. And when I walked in on what I thought was going to be an evening of seduction, it became something else. Karen was a sweet, frail girl. She still looked fairly healthy, not as gaunt as she would later become from anorexia. I spent most of the early evening talking with her about all kinds of things. Mostly she was fascinated and curious about my bed-hopping lifestyle. She didn't understand it. Although she did admit that lust is a strong urge, and she agreed that men were susceptible to the powers of lust, she was nonetheless convinced that I didn't actually want to do what I wanted to do, but was actually doing it to avoid intimacy and she said all of this in a very non-judgmental way. At the end of the conversation, I said, well, it was nice talking to you, I gotta go. She wanted to know where I was going. I said, I had left a girl upstairs and I would have to go and keep her company. Karen was flabbergasted that the girl would wait for me and simply not leave. I thought it was bizarre that she would even ask me that. Where I had initially walked down with seduction on my mind, the truth is sex, was the last thing that either one of us wanted from the other that night. Maybe because of that, the experience has remained in my mind all these years. Our lifestyle changed drastically after Destroyer, especially after the boost from Beth. I bought houses for both my parents, even though I hadn't seen my father since he left me as a child in Israel. Paul did likewise for his folks. But Ace and Peter lived at the edge, they bought many cars and lived in many houses. At one point, Ace built a home recording studio with poured concrete, then found he couldn't use it because his neighborhood wasn't zoned for it. Between them, they cracked up or crashed at least 10 cars, Mercedes, DeLoreans, you name it. The funniest one was Peter crashing in his garage. The fire department had to come in with the jaws of life to get him out of his car in his own garage. Another part of our lifestyle changed too. As I have said, we always had plenty of women on the road, but now we had the means to treat them like queens. And that caused problems in our personal relationships. There are some hilarious stories about Peter. I had a liaison with a girl, and then Peter fell for her. They saw each other for a little while. And then Peter brought her phone number back home. His wife was a jealous woman and was brighter than Peter. 
so he hid the phone number under the stereo. His wife was cleaning one day, and she actually lifted up the stereo and found the number. So she called up this girl and said, Hello, this is Oregon Health Department. Are you so-and-so? The woman said, Yes, why are you calling me? Well, we just need to find out if you're familiar with a Peter Criscola, who is otherwise known as Peter Chris, drummer in Kiss? Yes. Well, Peter's wife said, he may have the clap. We're trying to ascertain what period of time you may have had physical contact because you may need to get a checkup. Can you tell us the specifics? At this, the woman came clean with the specifics. It was this time of night, in this holiday inn. Thank you very much, Peter's wife said and hung up. When he came home, she had him pinned. Peter, where were you at 7.30 at night on Monday? Were you with so-and-so? She had him dead to rights. In May 1976, we sold out Madison Square Garden for three nights in a row. This was a big deal for us. When we were starting out, the four of us used to sit in our loft at 10 East 23rd Street and say that we had only 10 blocks to go to reach Madison Square Garden which is on 33rd Street. And now, we were there. CBS News had a broadcaster named Kaidi Tong. She was one of their big stars then. The cameras were all over us, and she kept asking me questions about the experience, less about rock and roll and more about the freak show aspect of our lives. You guys look so weird, and you are the guy who sticks his tongue out. How long is it, anyway? I was close to seven feet tall in the outfit, and she must have been about five two. Her arm was stretched way up into the air to hold the microphone near my mouth. While she was interviewing me, with the cameras all around me, I felt something in back of me. I turned around and my mom, all five four of her, was trying to fix something to make it look right. I was wearing a thin strip of leather with studs around it, and it ran right through the crack of my butt and connected to a codpiece covered with spikes, and my mother was trying to brush off a piece of lint or clean a spot or something. It was like trying to walk up in back of a tank and take off a piece of thread. By this time, my mother had remarried. Her new husband was a man named Eli, a Polish gentleman, who had lost some family in the war. He worked in the clothing business, and he worshipped my mother, if they were walking down the street and she saw a piece of clothing she liked in a window, he would study it intently and then make an exact replica for her. The timing of the remarriage was good, because it allowed me to get on with my life. When I was younger, it was just the two of us, my mother and me. And at that time, I probably would have had difficulty dealing with a remarriage. When Eli came along, though, I was already out of the house, at college, and ready to be on my own. Eli and my mother didn't really understand the band project. I had this pact with my mother. If my music career didn't work out, I would fall back on teaching. That seemed to satisfy her, but beyond that, it was all a mystery to them. I don't remember talking to either of them very much at that time. I was so busy trying to build up the band, although I do recall having conversations with Eli about politics. I was a young man, more liberal and more accepting of differences. He was less liberal. One of the things I came to understand was that when you had seen what he had seen, when you had witnessed your family murdered by people supposedly representing your government, you didn't necessarily believe in liberal politics. In 1976, Kiss went over to Europe for a major tour. We arrived at Heathrow Airport in London and came off the plane in full makeup. The press was all over us, and we drove around to all the sites and had pictures taken for the magazines. I was in awe, because it was England, the home of the Beatles. It was like a pilgrimage to Mecca. One of our female aides in England was an attractive Indian woman. By the time we got to our hotel, I convinced her to be my guest in my room. It was a fine welcome to a new country. Our hotel overlooked Hyde Park. It was a medium-quality hotel, but it prided itself on archaic notions of proper behavior. For instance, when I had female visitors, they were not allowed to visit me in my room, so I had to sneak them in. 
British nightlife was just as rewarding as American nightlife. One night we went to the Marquis Club and it was packed. I roamed around the room looking for a new friend or two. I walked up to the bar and asked for a Coke. I never drank and have literally never been drunk in my life. Patty Smith was standing next to the bar. I don't recall saying a word to her. I was more preoccupied by the two stunning girls standing at the far end of the room. All of a sudden, Smith turned, slapped me across my face, slurred something, and walked off. To this day, I'm clueless as to what made her do that. But it didn't take me long to walk over to the two lovelies, start dancing with both of them on the dance floor, and in short order, take them both back to the hotel. The ladies turned out to be two of the coconuts from Kid Creole and the Coconuts, a band I later loved and would often go to see. The evening at the hotel began hot and heavy. We were apparently making quite a bit of noise because there was a loud knock on my door. It was Paul. Didn't I realize, he said, that it was the middle of the night? Couldn't I keep the noise down? I apologized, came back in, and the girls and I moved the bed away from the wall, put the mattress on the floor, and continued on with our business. It was probably five in the morning when we all became ravenously hungry. I ordered a feast. It came up in a surprisingly short time. But I had inadvertently given the wrong room number, and the hotel delivered all the food to Paul's room. He was by that time in no mood to joke. From then on, Paul insisted he never wanted the room next to mine. The rest of Europe wasn't quite as fulfilling as England. For starters, the accommodations were different from what we had come to expect. European hotels weren't like American hotels. They were smaller, and the plumbing didn't always work the way it was supposed to work. Also, Alive wasn't selling well everywhere. So in some countries, we felt like we were starting all over. In some places, we packed arenas, and in some places, we played to mostly empty houses. France didn't have a strong rock and roll tradition. Even to this day, it hasn't produced rock stars of any consequence. At times, it was extremely frustrating. But for every France, there were places like the Scandinavian countries, which were wonderful. Wonderful crowds, wonderful fans, wonderful girls. We were thrilled with our newfound fame. It was what we had spent years working toward. Our families were thrilled for us, but even at the peak of our fame, we were isolated from the rest of the rock and roll world. We never appeared on other people's records. We never hung out. There was something solitary about us. This, too, was taken from the Beatles. When the Beatles played, nobody else belonged on that stage. If you were in the Stones... Tina Turner or whoever else could jump up on stage. But if you were in the Beatles, it was only the Beatles. That was how I felt about my band. If I went to see my band live, I didn't want to see anybody else step up. So we were like that. And through the years, everybody said, hey, let's go jam. We didn't jam. We didn't hang out before or after the show. For me, at least, it was always about chasing skirt. I couldn't have cared less about another guy playing guitar. I wanted to know who would share my bed that night. Also, at a time when movie stars often sat in the front row of rock shows, we never attracted any other celebrities. I have since learned that almost everyone in the world was a closet Kiss fan. Jimmy Buffett wrote a song called Manana, for example, where he said, You've never seen anything till you've seen a sunset. You've never seen a rock show until you've seen Kiss. Cheap Trick wrote Surrender about mom and dad rolling around on the couch with the kids' Kiss records. Every day of the week, I meet someone who's a Kiss fan, whether it's Garth Brooks or Lenny Kravitz. I have created a character named The Demon, who's a WCW wrestler and uses the Gene Simmons makeup. Last year, I got a request for an autograph from a five-year-old kid named David. His father requested it, actually, and asked if I would please make it out to David from the demon. Do you want me to write Gene Simmons, I asked? No, the father said. He doesn't know who Gene Simmons or Kiss is. He only knows about the demon, the wrestler. The monster has become the star. <laughs>